the moderator of Inside the SCAV. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is going to be a really insightful event. Um, my name is Aaron Maslansky. As Hillary mentioned, I host a podcast called Inside the SCEV, and uh, it's all about the people of Skokie and Evanston, Illinois, and some really interesting stories. And uh, But tonight, I, I am truly delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Rachel Fisher and Rachel Pasternak, and we're going to talk about their film, Joachim Prince, I Shall Not Be Silent. Um, he, Prince was a, a leader of the civil rights movement. He worked to organize the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, declaring bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem. The most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. Moments later, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Tonight, we're going to discuss the film with the producers and answer any questions that you may have in the audience. So before we get started, just a reminder, I want uh, you could submit questions via the chat box. So please type your questions there and uh, we'll do our best to get to everybody's questions uh, in the time that we have allotted. Um, but uh, Rachel and Rachel, I uh, so much appreciate you uh, both being here tonight to talk about your film and you know this whole... Um, Film Fest, this series is about social justice and the, the connection between the Jewish community to the Black community and the fight for social justice, justice and civil rights. And, uh, you know, you made this film a few years ago, but my God, it is a poignant film for, for today. Um, and we could talk about that a little bit later on. But at the beginning, what gave you the inspiration to focus on uh, Rabbi Dr. Prince and uh, create this film. Should I go, Rach? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Aaron. What gave us the inspiration to make the film was um, when I was in graduate school at the Jewish Theological Seminary in Manhattan, I um, was introduced to his family because my grandparents knew Rabbi Prince very well. And I was introduced, he had since passed away, but I was introduced to his daughter. Um, and encouraged to do a, a, a paper about him. And I found his, uh, she, in her basement were boxes. At the time, his, his materials had not yet been cataloged and um, were not in Cincinnati at HUC as they are now. So I came across his unpublished memoir and I read it you know, in one sitting, it was a couple hundred pages. And I had been in, I was, as I said, I, in graduate school at the seminary, I was 10 years, a 10 year graduate of a, I had attended Jewish day school for 10 years. Yeah. And I was like, he's, he's not been in the history books. Like this man needs to be, his story needs to be told. I just felt like he was such a hero in, every, in so many different ways. And I had this dream that he would, um, that student, especially students would learn about his legacy. I thought he was such a wonderful example. Um, so why, why do you think he wasn't in the history books? Do you want to take that, Rach? Sure. Um, we have a couple sort of hypotheses. Um, First of all, you know, um, Rabbi Prince um, lived for about 10 years um, after he retired. He, you know, lived another 10, 15 years. And for part of that time, he had pretty severe dementia and was oh. really out of the public eye. So the last like 10 years of his life, he was, he was out, of the, out of the public eye. Um, and, you know, in terms of the civil rights movement, um, we're learning now about so many figures who were really important in the civil rights movement, whose, whose stories weren't told because there was sort of a singular narrative of the civil rights movement focusing on Martin Luther King, who absolutely, you know, earned and deserves all of the all of the honor that he's given, but perhaps a, a somewhat oversimplified narrative developed, um, which didn't look at all of the people standing around Martin Luther King quite as much. And now that more time has passed, there's there's time for people like us and people who, you know, there was a film made about Bayard Rustin. Um, people are now focusing more on a lot of the women who were civil rights organizers. So there, there are still even more stories that haven't been told from that, from that period. 
Um, and then finally, you know, Rabbi Prince had a somewhat complicated relationship with um, sort of mainstream Jewish organizations um, because he was such an iconoclast and particularly his outspokenness on peace in Israel, which, um, you know, we tell that story in the latter part of the film. Um, so, so because there were so many people who perhaps hadn't agreed with him, um, you know, those folks were not necessarily in a big rush to, um, you know, sort of canonize him. Um, yeah, and, and, I, and I would just add also that B'nai Abraham was not affiliated. It wasn't officially a reformed conservative uh -huh. orthodox or reconstruction. So he didn't have that in terms of a Jewish, the Jewish world by itself, he, they weren't affiliated. So that's another way, right? That like people in the community, especially back then, they were very much about um, joining a, you know, they were very much members of a com of Jewish community. And so he was an independent, as such an independent figure, as Rachel's saying, um, in addition to that, his, his literal synagogue was not affiliated with a movement. So that was yet another reason that when he passed, it's up to, you know, people to bring back the pieces, right, of someone's story. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I did um, wonder about that if he was you know, part of conservative or reformer, or traditional or whatever it may be. Um, but I think for him, for how independent he was, and, and you show this at the beginning of the film, how when he's growing up in Germany, he's not your typical rabbi. He's your fun rabbi. He's the guy who can relate to everybody. He's the orator. He's the one who can inspire people. And uh, he was so effective in Germany. What do you think gave him that type of personality and the resilience to deal with the Nazis and not get killed? Oh, well, I think, I mean, to begin with, from such a young age, I remember reading in his biography that um, he, when he was little, he loved to be, you know, he had dreams of standing in front of crowds and he, he would play his violin and perform in front of people. So he just, you know, as you know, when, if you have kids, like, Sometimes they they pop out that way. So I think he always liked to be at the center of attention. And when you use the word resilience, I think of he, he had a somewhat um, fractured, like a, a difficult relationship with his father. So I think that he and losing his mother at a very young age, and they were so close that uh, I think he was just in his nature very strong. And then he also became stronger because he, you know, st was standing up to his father over and over again, his choice to become a rabbi was a rebellion within the family. They had lived in Germany for like 500 years, as we say in the film, and his father was a complete German patriot and a, a business owner and they did not go to synagogue. So I think those pieces of him were like always there. And then he was a, someone who was so passionate and loved so deeply, cared so deeply. And he had lost his mom young. He lost his first wife young. And I think sometimes those losses help you to become a bit fearless as well so and yeah. when and when the global the situation was changing in germany you know he had grown up they were the only jews in the town for many years he went to church with his christian nannies he felt like he was german until until he could literally smell that he wasn't like and because of who he was and because of his family history and all that he he was, as I explained, able to be fearless in, in speaking. And at the, it was that time as well that his, his message was so resonant. I just want to add, too, that I think um, that Rabbi Prince shared with Martin Luther King and John Lewis and many other leaders, um, you know, the spiritual strength and the belief that Yes, he liked to be the center of attention, but it wasn't for egotistical reasons. It was to carry a message, yeah. whether it was, you know, carrying the message of art, playing the violin, or carrying, you know, the message of, of the prophets. Um, so I think that, that that also makes you fearless because you are part of something that's bigger than you. And in a way, you're important because you have this charisma and this skill, but in a way you also don't matter, right? Because it's the message that matters. So if something happens yeah. to you, that's, that's not really the biggest consideration yeah. right in that moment. 
Right. He felt like he had a larger obligation to, um, to humanity than himself. Yeah. And you can see though, his fearlessness when he was in his synagogue in Germany and there are people vandalizing the place while the congregation is there. And he just walked up to them and said, can I help you? I mean, yeah. the guts that that takes, yeah. <laughs> it, it's not even guts. It's just like complete lack of death, uh, fear of death in a way. And yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, just I, I, it, that reminded me because also in his memoirs, I remember him talking about how he psychologically, like he would make sure to like look in the eyes of the Gestapo, like when he was called to their office or, and, and I think he was in, he just had this such confidence. He did have like amazing confidence. And like Rachel was saying, believed so strongly in his message and what his purpose was. And then he was also really socially adept. So he was, he, I think he had great confidence in that he'd be okay, even though he didn't, you can't really know that you'd be, but. Right. I mean, how many people were in his congregation in Germany? I mean, maybe he, he had the, the help in the, the numbers, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, the way it worked actually in in Berlin at the time was that um, the rabbis would go around to the different synagogues. So you didn't have a congregation oh. per se. Um, it would be like, oh, Prince is speaking at this one for the next three weeks, and then three weeks after that, going to a different one. And people would actually follow you, you know, from from synagogue to synagogue if they wanted to hear you. But he did have a big audience, like you're saying, like there yes. were people. He had around. a big following. It, yes, yeah. he had a big following for sure. I'm sure that translated into his success in the United States and bringing Martin Luther King Jr. to come to speak at his synagogue, which definitely must have been uh, controversial. And I think you touch on that in the film as well. But he had no fear of, I mean, some people may think, well, he wanted the attention, but really, like you said, it was about the, not at all. It was about the, the message and for him to let Martin Luther King Jr. come to speak at his place really shows you that he was more just about getting out the right message, the positive mm-hmm. message that was needed to be heard by the people in his congregation. Yeah, that was actually Martin Luther King Jr. What coming wasn't like a big glamorous. It wasn't like a gala. It was part of a like a monthly lecture series or I don't know how often but my, I mean my grandfather would have loved to have gone <laughs> what's that I would have loved to have gotten the yeah I mean they had Cesar Chavez there like he brought you know he brought political fi- you know people there who were controversial so because he he his one of his lines was um he I detest uniformity of thought I love a controversial a controversial discussion so I'm sure he they brought people there that would engage and um you know really where they would that would be educational but also enlightening and maybe enraging sometimes yeah was there any pushback from you know the people who were following martin luther king jr or just the black community in general to having the participation of uh you know a rabbi or the jewish community within the civil rights movement at that time I don't believe at the beginning, no. I mean, I think Prince, as far as we can see, Prince met Martin Luther King in 1958. They may have met earlier, but in terms of what we could find historical evidence for. um, And I think at that point, um, you know, King and the other people in the movement were absolutely looking for allies and, you know, were very, very glad to have the support. Um, Obviously later in the civil rights movement, you know, uh, um, post after the March on Washington, sort of 1967, you know, that's when you start getting, you know, more of the black nationalist movement and you get that internal struggle within the black the larger black liberation movement. Um, Mm -hmm. And there it was really a question of who's going to be in leadership positions and making sure that, um, you know, black people were in leadership positions. Um, And that's, you know, famously, of course, John Lewis, um, that's when he resigned from from SNCC. Um, 
So, would- so that was something that happened later. But I think at, at the beginning um, and through a large part of the movement, no, I think, I think the more, the more the better. I mean, I have a good friend here in Maplewood who's active in our local um, Black Lives Matter activism who says, we can't do this by ourselves. You know, we're a minority. We can't do this by ourselves. And I think that's how they felt. How did he, you know, part of it's trust. How did he build that trust, uh, you know, with other, with, with other communities within the Jewish community to, you know, put himself out there completely to uh, make these positive changes. Uh, what, do you, what, like, what do you mean? building? Well, trust? I mean, I think that sometimes, you know, there must've been some, maybe not at the beginning, but as time went on, as you speak about it, I mean, there must've been some hesitation of who's really an ally. What are people really out there? To, what, what are, what are uh-huh. they looking to gain? But really, from what from what he was looking at it from his perspective, I believe from the film that I gather, that his whole point was for freedom. That everyone, every you know, you talk about um, neighbor isn't a geographic term. Like he just really believed in the good of humanity. But some people might be looking for fame uh-huh. or or power or something else within that. You know, there are probably FBI agents who are involved and uh-huh. trying to get into different movements to be able to, you know, work whatever angle there was. Right. But how did he build trust? I think, I, I think there's a couple different things. Um, also I mean, obviously showing up is important. Um, and I also think that when people saw him sometimes getting pushback from within his own community, um, yeah that's how you know you have a real ally is if somebody is willing to take criticism and and still doesn't change their their positions so i think that was part of it too yeah and i would say i think you can tell when someone's authentic and speaking from their heart and it wasn't just like he had this idea in freedom which he did but that was born of something so deep with inside him when he saw what happened in his country and in Germany. And then when he was here, he was willing to do whatever he ca- could to not have that happen, you know, cause that this was like, other than Israel, this was, you know, the best place to be. And then this was the best, this is where he, they picked up and moved and they were immigrants, you know? So right. um, that was a lot to fight for. And I think he was consistent with his efforts. As you could see, he was right. I mean, he was like, you know, he had a track record and he was speaking from his heart and he was very, very smart. And he, congregants told us over and again, what a wonderful rabbi he was too. Like he showed up for them. He showed up on the big, big time. And he showed up, you know, when you were in the hospital. He showed up to your birthday party. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. There's that saying, um, if, um, you know, if you've come here to help me, I don't want your help. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And, you know, Rabbi Prince definitely felt that the, um, you know, the survival of the Jewish people, the liberation of the Jewish people, um, the removal of oppression for the Jewish people depended on the removal of oppression for everyone. And people could tell that about him. So you're not really just trying to help somebody else. You're really fighting for yourself. Yeah. Too. Yeah. You're tying your, your bigger reason for being with that of the greater good in many exactly. ways. Yeah. Yeah. How, who do you think is kind of his successor in this type of role, like in today's world? Do you see anyone who is? I think it's such, it's such a different time that in some ways we're all called to be that person. You know, we're all called to be Rabbi Prince. I mean, I keep thinking about this and we've been asked it before. Like, I mean, communication has changed like a million percent, right? So, right. <laughs> um, 
I mean, it was pretty radical that at the March on Washington in 1963, he just like ad hoc, you know, he, that was like basically kind of like a long tweet, right? Like he like quickly <laughs> made, <laughs> gave a, a speech like, but otherwise it took a lot of thought. Like every time you want to sit down and write a letter, you know, you sat at the typewriter and that was the process. So um, anyway, my, my point is, is that so many people are sharing the microphone now, but um, I think there are some organizations that are doing really great work um, so I, I would look in that sense. I feel like people at certain organizations, um, in addition to you, right? Like every, we never, the people are, there's such a platform now for so many right. that, um, so in that sense, it's, it's our, cause the Jewish world is so, and in general, people, as you know, are not affiliated as they were then. So, and I don't think that people are looking necessarily for a hero in that way. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just, we don't have the same hierarchy. And um, I think rabbis, for example, are much more personable and, 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 and people are not necessarily looking for a rabbi to be on a platform anymore. You know, I, I think that, yeah. So I, I, I think that we all have to look and ha like, how can we be like Rabbi Prince, you know? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it's very, um, I guess, uh, broken down, like you said, like where everybody can have a platform to say something in many ways, um, Twitter, or so any Facebook or anything. And that's a little bit kind of the, the harder part about kind of corralling a message because everybody's got their own platform and there's not as much of a, of leadership in, in many ways. But I think that what he did can be an inspiration for good. I mean, were there people like, are his, is his family still involved in anything with the missions that he worked on or his congregation? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. His, his daughter who's in the film is very involved in um, social justice and in interfaith um, work. And inter and what would you say? It's inter. What is the organization? It's like well, she she works with an inter interfaith environmental group. Right, Deborah does. Um, okay. Yeah, Jen, his son has a has a, his son writes extensively. He has a blog, so he's very outspoken. I think they're definitely like they're not afraid to speak their mind. You know, like for sure. And then they they're both they've both been leaders in their own ways. Like you know, Jonathan as a writer and Deborah at the, at the school she was affiliated with for many years and in her other volunteer work. And then actually, interestingly, his grandchildren, um, like one of his grandchildren was like the, you know, the national leader for Young Judea and like a huge Zionist. And then one of his grandsons, Rachel is at a screening with him. He's a professor at Kuhn, it's this, a New York University. Um, so he really and, passed down to the generations. And now, and now actually his congregation was within the last year, because I think it's hard to follow someone like a rabbi prince. So the, the rabbis, you know, the, Rabbi Clifford Coolwin, who was a couple rabbis removed from Rabbi Prince, was the one who thought, wow, he was an amazing human being. We have to catalog his papers. So that was the start. It was, he discovered, you know, he realized like, we need to like get Rabbi Prince's message in one place and all his work and so that, and then, he was helpful in having his um, his memoirs published. So in terms of that, and now the current rabbi at Rabbi Prince's synagogue, I, I haven't met him yet, but I read that like he chose that pulpit. One of the main reasons is because he wanted to, he he was so influenced by Rabbi Prince's work. And um, so now I think they have like maybe a young Rabbi Prince. <laughs> yeah, someone who's really been influenced and moved by his work is now the rabbi of that temple. That's really beautiful. I mean, some of the inspirational people that um, I think are passed down from from him are were on your advisory committee for the film. What was it like working with some of the people, like like his daughter or other, uh, you know, Senator Booker? You had um, what was that like, and what kind of information did they give you to help you with the film? Um, well, I want to give some more credit again to Rabbi Colwyn who, um, as Rachel said, sort of was the one who really, I think, affirmed for the family that their father's legacy was significant and that they needed to preserve his story and preserve his papers. And he's a historian, um, so. Right, and he's a historian and he's done a lot of writing about Rabbi Prince. 
Um, and he writes a lot of op-eds and things like that. So it was great working with him. And Rabbi Colwyn was the person who had a relationship with Cory Booker. Um, because yeah. Rabbi Colwyn, again, sort of taking the legacy of Prince and B'nai Abraham very seriously, had done some really good work with um, what you might call the Newark diaspora, like the, all of these Jews who had moved out to the suburbs um, outside of Newark. Rabbi Cohen had done some really good work um, reconnecting with the city and helping people try to support uh, the work that Cory Booker was doing and trying to, you know, um, sort of revive the city and, and, and support the citizens there. Yeah. So we, um, we met Cory Booker through uh, Rabbi Colwyn. And Cory Booker's probably biggest contribution, in addition to <laughs> us being able to interview him, was giving us our name of R squared when we met him. Really? So he just jokingly <laughs> said, oh, Rachel and Rachel, R squared. <laughs> so as you can imagine, we didn't get a lot of his time. <laughs> and then, and then but he, was at a, he was at a screening, actually, at B'nai Abraham. Yes, it's, and it's, he it's, talks it's, about Rabbi Prince a lot. I mean, it's yeah. worth noting that the, the 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 evening that Rachel is referring to with Cory Booker, that was a that's also in the film, and that is when um, it, the synagogue, Ben Abraham, that's now a church in Newark, was um, given national landmark status. So that it was an event around that. Again, which is an example of Rabbi Cohen's coming to Newark, as well as Deborah Prince's, that that was able, you know, that that was able to happen. Um, so that was, that was a great evening because members of that congregation that hadn't been there in so many years came back down to Newark, even though only 15 or 20 minutes away from where they live, but they hadn't been there. Um, so yeah, it was a real return. And Well, it's typical of many American cities yeah. where, you know, people, groups of people move, migrate to different neighborhoods uh -huh. and then you haven't been there in, you know, a long time. I, uh, I know here in Chicago, where I am, um, you know, my mom's whole family was on the west side of Chicago, and now there's tours to go see the old exactly. synagogues, which are now churches, exactly. um, and they haven't been there in years. So it, it's uh, it's important to recognize the history and the connections that we all have within the geographic metropolitan areas that we we live in. Uh -huh. um, but you got some tremendous archives. I mean, a lot of the uh, footage that you pulled was from you know, maybe the 1950s and 1960s, different interviews, and you had some new ones. How were you able to tie that all together where you can kind of see the, uh, where you can tie in the old footage and then immediately to something, you know, newer with like, when you had, you know, John Lewis speaking, but then you, you, there's images of him being beaten during a protest. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's really painstaking. I mean, we worked with, we had, we had great editors, um, and we worked with them and we drove them crazy. Um, <laughs> um, we, you know, we spent a lot of time, you know, just painstaking, go, go back two seconds, go back, you know, two tenths of a second. I think we need to cut it here. And it's, it's very painstaking, um, but- And then for the footage- like, Yeah, I was just gonna say for us, the footage, at least for me, you know, um, Rachel, I'll let you speak for yourself. I don't know if you felt the same way, but even now when I see the film, the footage is, is my favorite part by far. I mean, and, and you see new things in it. Every time you watch it, you see new things in the footage. So it, we felt like it was important to really use as much of that as we, we could. And we tried to do as little narration as possible. So we just put the narration in when we felt like it was absolutely necessary but we tried to really tell the story through the footage and the interviews. And um, yeah. and Rabbi Prince, we, we did searches within, you know, to find out footage, you know, to track him, to see how often, I mean, he was, he was in the New York Times regularly. And then we hired professionals to, to dig up the archival information as well. So we had, you know, different people helping us tell um, the best story. You know? Well, it really flowed through. Um, you know, it's, uh, I thought it was terrific how, uh, to learn about it. Cause I, I honestly, I didn't really know much about him. Uh -huh. Um, 
you know, I knew that there were Jews that were involved in the civil rights movement and I heard about different things over the years, but never in depth. And I think that's really important because sometimes today you don't realize the strong connections between different communities within America, especially within the Jewish community and, and what are, um, you know, the things that the values that we get from our, um, from our heritage. And it's important to kind of imbue yourself with that and realize and be proud of it and use it to work towards something that is for the greater good. Um, you know, one question I have is, you know, since you know so much about Rabbi Prince, what do you think his response would be today? I mean, right now with social justice, with how the world is dealing with a pandemic, how would he inspire us? You want me to go first, Rach, since you're thinking, or do you want to go first? I'm, I'm, I'm good either way. Uh, well, you can go because I don't, I don't know what I'm going to say, so go ahead. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure either, really. Um, I always have a hard time with that because I always want to make sure that I don't just put my own words in you know, Rabbi Prince's mouth and say, oh, yeah. well, he would think everything that I think because he's not here. Um, but I think that, um, you know, Rabbi Prince was very wary of anything that threatened democracy. Um, and, um, I think that he would be very alarmed at, um, you know, the, the state of our democracy. And I think he would absolutely be speaking out about it just as many people as many people are. Um, something I always remember from the film is when he talks about the soul and the moral health of the nation. And I think that's what he would be concerned about is the moral health of the nation. Yeah. Do you think he'd be fighting for the moral health of the nation or would he be telling people to leave? I think I think he would be fighting for the moral health of the nation. I don't think he would be telling Jews to leave right now. Um, perhaps, you know, um, America is such a big country. It's, it's a different situation. And there are so many, there are so many minorities that it's a different situation than in Germany. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he would, he would believe that if we all band together and we support each other, that we can get things going in the right, in the right direction. That makes me I, hopeful. I mean, I think that he would, uh, it's hard to really answer it, but, but to, to, to answer it, I would just say like, if he, let's say for example, to picture him on his pulpit, to answer your question, if he was speaking from there, you know, well, he, first of all, he'd be repeatedly talking about the four letter word vote. So right now, but going back for the last four years, he would just, I, I'm sure, you know, he, his, his sermons were very political. So, you know, he would be tying in our history with today and educating, you know, informing and wanting people, he really wanted his congregants to be informed, you know? So the first thing is really know what you're, be informed about your, the pol political situation and um, and do something about it, you know, so that yeah. that's the other thing. voting and speaking out and writing letters or giving money like however you can make your voice heard. And hopefully from an educated position, you know, mm -hmm. not out of fear. Exactly. That you was know, just about to say that. Yeah, not out of fear, but um, out of justice and a one a yoga teacher that I admire very much said yesterday and she's, you know, very outspoken among about many things, in, in, including, you know, um, racial injustice and all that said, love big, you know? And it's not like love big woohoo, what does that mean? No, really like love humanity. Like that's what Rabbi Prince did, you know? Like what would love do in this day? You know, mm -hmm. if we're all looking at each other like that and, and it's not a time to be silent. So no, vote would be my last thing, vote <laughs> would be when I he mean, was there. <laughs> You talk about how he would tell people to get educated and to know about things so they can vote and they could take action. Um, one of the things that you have on your webpage for the movie is that you 
uh, work with educators to, you know, help this help schools teach about Rabbi Prince, teach about, you know, social justice, things of that nature. Have you worked with a lot of schools and how do you do it now uh, with, you know, the current situation? Well, you take that, Rachel, because Rachel has done more of it recently. Um, I'm trying to think if there have been any schools. I think you did I, one summit, right? Or, or was it? Or was oh, that well, there, there have been a, bun a bunch of schools that have shown the film and that we've done Q and A's with, we've done workshops, but I don't think there's been one since the pandemic, since oh, okay. kids oh. are home. I don't think we've done a lot of these virtual um, Q and A's with adults. I don't think we've done a school one um, virtually. Um, yeah. So the last one that I did was probably in February or something, usually what, you know, January around Martin Luther King's birthday, Black History Month, that's when, you know, schools will often show the film. And it's been a great experience whenever we can, we can um, show it, show it in schools. And I think students really appreciate knowing this history. Um, and I think, I think it inspires them and it makes yeah. them feel hopeful. So, it inspired so it's me. been great. Yeah. yeah, and we had one, two little stories. One, it's not the, the direct answer to your question, but a couple of years back, we showed, we showed the film at a university here. And I guess he's a professor, right? One of the professors who was part of that and is involved in his own social justice work wrote to us a couple months ago that he and his wife just had a child and they named the child Yoachim. Wow. <laughs> And then another story from about the youth is that um, uh, people we know in California, uh, there was a screening of, of the film and this young boy was so inspired by Rabbi Prince's story that I think he was tying Rabbi Prince's story into his mitzvah project and, um, you know, really, really influenced and, and inspired by the story. And then finally, I would say, even though this was a while back, there was a wonderful screening at the Newark Museum of students, mostly African American students, um, at that screening at the museum, and afterwards, you know, they said we didn't know that blacks and Jews ever worked together, you know. So, and that's been the case over and over again. That um, this enlightening and thinking, seeing, like, wow, that that could be too, like it was, and it could be again, you know. Right. Well, I think oh, that oh, I want to give a gratitude to the JCC for putting on this program to highlight the, the, the work that the Jewish community has done and together to, um, to promote you know, freedom and, and social justice. And I think that, I, I would hope that your film gets played into more classrooms during these times because you know, things can be done like this and right. um, uh -huh. it'd be great for you to be able to speak to a group of students who can can learn more about it? It's so important, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Um, you know, the the two of you have worked together on this, and uh, you know, you co-produce it. How how did you? You know, one of the questions from the audience is, how did you meet, and how did you divide up the the work, and you know, get things out there? We we met because of the thoughtfulness of one person. <laughs> um, anyway, so I met this this guy, this person, Rachel's friend once, and he, we were both involved in history work, oral history work. And he said, you guys should meet. And so we met from, Av his name is Avram. <laughs> um, we met through one person and then uh, we collaborated on one short film together. It wasn't an original film. It was uh, uh, called Remembering Ashvenshim. It was using footage from uh, the Shoah, Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation. And we, we were able to, um, we just really divided that work. There wasn't any, you know, delineation and you'll do this and you'll do that. And it's interesting um, for this film, I think we just sort of, we didn't formally divide up, but there were things that I was, you know, more inclined to be doing that were more suited for my personality. And Rachel, like Rachel was, Rachel has her PhD. I have a master's. Rachel is that much more into research. So Rachel was a bit more involved in the footage and that piece. And I would say I was more involved maybe in like some outreach and connecting with donors and things like that. Um, but really we were both together in, in, the, in the room, in the editing room alongside, you know, the three editors. Um, and the thing that we really shared is 
I think we were so committed, Rachel and I both have a, a deep love of history and Jewish history and believe in the stories of people. We both learned that from our grandfathers. And once Rachel and I came upon the story, I think we knew we had to tell it, you know? So that was the other piece. Like we were in it till, for the, till the end, you know? Yeah. We never right. thought we're, we're not gonna do it or we didn't it, make this money, you know? Right, right. In the beginning, um, you know, nobody believed in this project except for us. <laughs> so that, that will, we were, we were already close, but that, that <laughs> definitely bonds you. <laughs> Why is it so important for the two of you to tell stories? I think our stories are everything. I mean, my grandfather, I credit him with that really because he believed that we each have a story that can be told. And he taught me that because he would often write down on his typewriter, he'd type out what it was like when he was growing up, what it was like when he met my grandmother, what, you know, so I, I really, and then I went on to become a journalist and captured people's stories very much influenced by that. Um, so I think that's how we learn, you know, like when you said you didn't know about Rabbi Prince, it's like, how do we learn information? Like it's now our generation or you're younger, but movies, television, school, and then our, what our families tell us, you know? Right. So if, if you have a captive audience when your kids, until they go to college um, and a great deal of influence on them. So it's a missed opportunity not to share the stories of other generations of their, because how do they get, how do, I feel like, how do you get a perspective otherwise, you know? I agree. I feel like it's, um, you know, just being connected to history connects you with the rest of humanity and being connected to history and even the future is telling the stories. Mm -hmm. exactly. Absolutely. And I, you know, obviously we're, we're people of the book and that's what the Torah is. It's a story. And yeah. I feel like, you know, I oftentimes think about the people who heard those stories and passed them down orally, and then eventually somebody wrote it down. And I feel like, and then somebody, somebody else copied it you know, and I, I basically feel like that's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. In a graphic format. Have you worked on other films since? I have been working on writing um, screenplays. So I wrote a screenplay about Rabbi Prince. Um, and I'm working now on a a script about Frances Perkins, who was the first female cabinet secretary in US history. She was FDR's labor secretary and was responsible for essentially the entire social safety net that we have now, including social security. So wow. another another story that is not told as much as it should be. No, didn't yeah. know about that either. <laughs> yeah, look her up. Look I didn't her up. either until, yeah. So as she also actually, the reason I got involved with her is that she was the really the only person in FDR's cabinet who tried to save Jewish refugees. Um, and she was pretty much foiled at every, at every turn, but she was, and she was not Jewish, but um, she was very close to the Jewish community and she really tried to save uh, refugees and was pretty much the only person doing that in the thirties. Um, that had that was in government. So, so that's how I got into her. So I've been telling stories that way um, since then. We have not made we have not made another film. Yeah, I've been building. Uh, I do, you know, committed work more around health and wellness. I think it's still about stories though, and still mm -hmm. about there's you know similarities to the film and what I'm doing now, but it's more focused on um, health and wellness and making a film is a roller coaster you know like unless unless it's like your day job for hbo or showtime or you know netflix but um for us it was just you know it, it was a bit much about the fundraising as it was about the storytelling and it was it was tricky to, to have kids at home and be doing that so i think each of us now are even as our kids have gotten older just doing something that's maybe has a little bit more of a balance to it you know Right, because you're always trying to convince somebody that it, that it makes sense. I mean, you both said that uh, nobody else believed in it at the beginning. <laughs> How did you ultimately get funding? I mean, we, it took us eight years to make the film because 
every time we, we wanted to do an interview, we had to raise the money to hire our, our director of photography. Um, so it was through introductions of a lot of different people, through people we knew, through people the Prince family knew, and, and, um, and then people who believed in us uh, through the synagogue, that you know, and every time someone made a, a, a significant contribution that could take us to the next step, it was really pushed us to go to the next person, you know. Um, and so Andre and Kelly Hunter were our biggest donors, and they, Andre's mother was very close to Rabbi Prince, and she had her own like fascinating story. Someone could do a film about her. She was also she was from Germany as well. Um, so I, I say we we made the film. But people who believe in the medium of film and believed in the power of the story, you know, needing to be told. Yeah. Well, it's important. Were you able to get it onto different TV networks or has it been played in many different festivals? Yeah, I saw that question. It was, it, it, so we hired a distributor in 2014, Menemsha Films in California. And it, it, it was part of a lively film festival circuit. And um, so in addition to film festivals, and each year it continues to be shown, it's been at schools. Um, and now our distributor has a, this, um, he a, streaming. a streaming service. I forget what it's called. High it's, called it's called um, High, High Flex. Flex. Oh, High yeah. Flex, right. So people can, now you can, because uh, he, our distributor has not wanted to release it for streaming, but now through, through Menemsha Films, it can be streamed. We did have a agreement, I mean, a, a agreement, let's say, P Channel 13 Public PBS said they would certainly broadcast it years back, but we had to come up with the funds to have it widely seen. And we didn't, you know, we didn't have the interest really to raise more money to get it put on television. So, yeah. Well, if anyone's listening from any of those organizations, I think it's an important story that we need to tell right now. And uh, you know, just get it out there, the, the message, and, and to continue to inspire people. Um, I do just want to mention if anyone else from the audience has any other questions, please put it in the chat. Um, but um, you know, what do you? So you both are working on these. Uh, you know, you're working on health and wellness, and and you've got the screenplays going on. Uh, what do you see in the future in the next couple of years for yourselves? Uh, do you do you see another um, another film that you might make together or anything uh, on that that front or just continue on your paths what you're doing right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to, um, you know, maybe one of my screenplays will get produced at some point. Um, yeah. I have had a few things optioned, so there's there's hope. Um, and I'm just going to keep keep working and keep writing. Yeah. Um, I could see publishing a book in the future um, on one of these subjects, but um, and possibly another. I actually do have another documentary that I want to make about um, about the segregation of public schools in Philadelphia, where I'm from. Um, so that's that's I, I have the seed of that you know, in my mind. Um, and so that's, that's long-term. So, so I, I might have one or two more in me. Okay. And I guess I see myself now as um, the mess, the messenger of my own message. Like I'm teaching yoga and I am a musician. So I am continuing to grow and offer my own stories and my own gifts to people and also hope to share a memoir of my own, so. Well, that's important work, especially now. I mean, yoga and health are just so important to keep us healthy during stressful times and, uh, you know, whatever comes our way. Um, you know, just want to ask you, do you have any final thoughts, anything, any, where should people go if they want to learn more about the film? Um, well, you can go to our website, which, which um, you know, has a little bit more about us. It has some articles. It also has um, a blog that we've written with several articles by both me and Rachel, by one or the other of us or by us together. Um, and it has some video and it has some excerpts of some of the source material that didn't necessarily get into the film. So for people who are interested in exploring Rabbi Prince further and some of our ideas further, 
I think those blog posts are a really good place to look. There's also a link to an article that we wrote about Rabbi Prince in Moment Magazine that tells some parts of his story that also aren't in the film. So the website is, is probably the best place. Thank and you. also, um, were you going to mention Michael Myers' book, Rachel? Or no, I was going to mention our oh. Facebook page because our Facebook page is pretty active. Like that, we oh, post yeah. there. we post there, and thank you, Hillary, for posting our website. Um, so yeah, if, if they people want to follow or just check out the Facebook page, that's another. And then, right, Michael Professor Michael Myers' um, book, "Rebellious Rabbi," is Rabbi Prince's story from mostly from Germ through Germany and a little bit of America, but. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us tonight and for creating this film. It's important work and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, I want to remind everybody that next week um, is the final discussion for this series. Uh, it's called Shared Legacies with filmmaker Shari Rogers. So if you want more information, go to jccfilmfest.jccchicago.org slash social justice series. Um, but uh, really appreciate everybody tuning in, asking some uh, insightful questions and uh, wish you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks Pleasure. so much. Keep telling your stories. <laughs> Will do. Take care.